So let me bring in Brian because he's got to run along. And I thank you again for joining us. Um, I, I think the, the last question you asked is the most important question. Why does, uh, why does this matter? And why does Julian Assange's case matter? And matter, of course, not only to him and to his family, which it obviously would, but to all of us, all the people who actually believe in justice, who want to tell the truth, uh, it matters most importantly because what Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have done, not once, not twice, not even 20 or 30 or 40 times, but hundreds of times, is revealed documents that are true. Revealed documents and stories, all of which are proved to be true, none of which have been uh, claimed by anyone to be untrue, that reveal that governments that speak in our name are carrying out criminal activity of all types, including and most notably in the case of the Iraq war, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and most importantly, the crime against peace. Uh, the WikiLeaks documentation, which all of the media wanted to get, you think about the Iraq war logs, for instance, uh, the, the journalist from Reuters who was shot dead in cold blood along with others, including many civilians, including children who were badly wounded by that U.S. A, a, a Apache a, a helicopter pilot. Uh, Reuters wanted to get those documents. They wanted to get that video. They knew that video existed. Um, and, and matter of fact, they filed public records requests for that video. The, the video, when one sees it, and I hope everyone has seen it, or if you haven't seen it, take a moment to go look and find it. Uh, that video shows that the U.S. government military personnel were engaged in crimes against humanity and war crimes. Now, we know about that because, uh, not because of Reuters, because they were unsuccessful in their FOIA bid, their public request bid, public records request bid. Bid. We know about it because of what WikiLeaks did. WikiLeaks had the guts to publish this. And, and right now what the U.S. government is trying to do by demonizing Julian and criminalizing Julian and making it impossible for Julian to have free movement uh, is to try to shut him down and shut WikiLeaks down. And most importantly, to shut anybody down who wants to either be a whistleblower a truth teller, or to do that which WikiLeaks is also doing, which is to publish uh, materials that the public needs to know. So this is, uh, this is an epic battle. It's a David and Goliath battle, clearly. Uh, it matters to us because if they succeed uh, doing this, uh, we, we the people, we the public, lose this valuable source of information. And other whistleblowers who are contemplating should they tell the truth that should they ex uh, 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 expose uh, criminal activity or fraud or abuse should they come forward uh, again it, it's a it's a chilling message it's designed to create a monumental headwinds for any potential whistleblower to contemplate that they might uh, suffer the same fate arbitrary detention being holed up possi possibly facing as you put it, many, many years in prison. Uh, we should also care because when we see, as we did in the, in the Virginia court case in the last week in Judge Brinkema's court, it, we've entered this ne ne never world, this unbelievable Alice in Wonderland, well, Kafka-esque uh, world whereby the court has a secret grand jury and, and, and the word leaks out that a grand jury exists. And then the uh, Julian Assange and his legal team come in to ask the court to unseal the indictment so that Julian Assange in particular and his legal team can understand the indictment. And the judge says, well, the public's desire to, to understand what ha what's happening is quote, premature. Like, what does that mean? That, that was, that's her words. It's a premature desire to learn the truth about a, 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 a secret grand jury. So it's, a secret grand jury is in existence, apparently. It inadvertently, through a court filing, is acknowledged to, to in fact exist. Julian Assange goes into court, 
and the judge rules, quote, courts cannot perform the delicate balancing required by the First Amendment and common law doctrines under such circumstances. And then by, by acknowledging uh, if she were to unseal the indictment, she would be revealing that a grand jury in fact does exist and the government has kept the grand jury secret. So then you must ask yourself, what's the point of having a court? What's the point of having a court if the judges feel so duty bound to defend the national surveillance state, even as it commits and conducts itself in illegal ways? Uh, what's the point of having a court? I mean, it truly is a Kafkaesque nightmare uh, whereby no one can actually, no one is entitled to learn the truth. And if you learn the truth and want it confirmed, your desire to learn the truth is, quote, premature. Because, of course, the secret keepers haven't made it publicly available information. But nor will they. That's the point of a secret grand jury proceeding. I mean, it's really, uh, it makes one's head spin. So uh, I think that's, those are some of the issues. There's one other issue that I want to highlight. I'm, I'm working, Joe, in the last couple hours and in the last couple days, actually, to launch uh, what will be an, a national march on Washington, on the White House on Saturday, March 16th. Uh, and it has a, a wide array of organizations and well-known individuals who are coming together to demand, uh, well, to show, actually, that the American people don't agree that Donald Trump and Mike Pence and John Bolton and Mike Pompeo have the right to determine who the government is in Venezuela. Uh, so we're having a demonstration that says in its main slogan, US hands off Venezuela, no to the coup, no to sanctions, no to a new war. It's very important to link these issues together. The US government has already conducted a soft coup uh, well, it's not a soft coup. It was a soft coup at first, and now it's a very hard coup against the formerly democratically elected and non-corrupted government of Dilma Rousseff and the Workers' Party in Brazil. They've carried out regime change operations on Honduras. They're trying to, obviously, and are determined to overthrow the Venezuelan government. And you can see by the, uh, by really the a combination of covert operations, overt operations, and pressure on, org on countries, say, like Ecuador, uh, that what the United States is basically telling all of the leaders in Latin America is you do our bidding, you follow us, you stop pretending to be independent, you stop challenging the empire, or we will crush you. And so the US government in cahoots with elites have crushed progressive governments in, in Brazil and Argentina and, and we know now also in Ecuador, uh, they wanna snuff out the voices of independence and resistance. And, and partly uh, we know that without the change in the government in, in Ecuador, uh, what's happening right now to Julian would not be happening. So all of these issues are interconnected. The right of people in Latin America to be free, to be self-determining, uh, to be free of economic sanctions and pressure of all types, and also the ability uh, of Latin American countries to unite with and, and, com and form common cause with other truth tellers like, uh, like the former president of Ecuador did with Julian Assange, where under great pressure, he did not relent to the dictates of the empire and gave Julian Assange asylum in the embassy. So, you know, it's all connected. It really is connected. And, and I, I wanna mm -hmm. tell the people who are concerned about uh, Venezuelan freedom or concerned about the issues of war and peace or the issues of climate and climate change or who care about transparency, uh, we shouldn't be fighting a lot in, in little silos independent from each other as if as if as if each issue uh, stands and lives unto itself. We need to we need to draw the, the connecting dots. And that's why I'm hoping and we will present Julian's case at this mass march for Venezuela on March 16th, 
to make the point that standing for freedom in Venezuela also means standing for freedom with all of those who are who are being targeted by state repression. And that, of course, in this case, first and foremost, means Julian Assange. So anyway, those are so those are some of my thoughts. I, I was very um, you can't help but be upset by the by the Virginia court ruling this weekend. Again, a truly Kafkaesque nightmare. Indeed, it is, Brian. Uh, she says that the reason she will not accede to the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press request to unseal it is because there's no evidence that it even exists. And there is evidence, of course, that inadvertent filing says clearly Assange has been charged. Um, but that didn't seem to mean much. And her reasons, Brinkham, his reasons also uh, is that... Um, uh, the, why the government keeps indictments or criminal complaints sealed is to uh, prevent the accused from avoiding arrest. Well, I mean, <laughs> Julian's already doing that by staying inside the embassy. He's not going anywhere. So there's no fear of him fleeing. That is immediate. And also destroying or tampering with evidence. Well, the evidence is out there. Well, the evidence that uh, uh, of the documents that they get, which classified have been published, of course, they, they know who their sources are, and that's something the government would like to know as well and will not be revealed by WikiLeaks. Uh, um, so these reasons are absurd. Kafkaesque is the right way, uh, right way to describe that. And as far as Venezuela goes, I just want to add that you won't read in the corporate media about the long, long, long history of this type of thing in Latin America by the United States. It's a long, old playbook from creating the nation of Panama out of Colombia to build a canal to... Uh, to uh, Wilson's invading of Mexico, to certainly all the coups in the 1970s uh, in Latin America where fascist-type dictators like Augusto Pinochet were installed by the U.S. Uh, so this is nothing new, unfortunately, but it continues, and it's really great to know that you're putting that march together uh, because the, we have to speak out against that. And as I mentioned, uh, WikiLeaks republished it this week on Twitter, their economic warfare manual that the U.S. uses to bring governments down. So all the information is there, uh, but you're not going to be reading about that in the New York Times, that information, economic warfare, are you, Brian? No, indeed, indeed not. And and it's just, it's the, the double speak in all of these is so remarkable. Here you have like the U.S. government under Obama. It's not simply Trump, although Trump has taken it to a new level putting economic sanctions on, on a country like Venezuela, for instance, as they did in Chile between 70 and 73, um, a, as they did in Panama before the invasion of Panama in 1989, uh, you name it, uh, economic sanctions go hand in hand with covert operations and then later military operations. But the, but the US government creates economic pain and suffering of a great a type. Uh, Henry Kissinger coined the phrase, we want to make the economy scream. Well, of course, that's people screaming. They're screaming because they don't have food or medicine. Uh, they're screaming. Uh, and then with the hope being that some parts of the population, like the middle class in particular, that's not used to the same suffering that the poor daily endure no matter what, the middle class will go into the streets and, and provide the human material for a political opposition that then becomes the human material for the coup d'etat. The final, the final, you know, death and destruction of a targeted entity, and and then when the people are screaming and they go into the streets because there's no food or no water or no medicine, or unemployment is skyrocketing, then the same government that imposed the sanctions turns around and says, "We are we are with those poor people in Venezuela or Chile or Guatemala or Panama. We are with them. We feel their pain." And we know that the problem is corruption and mismanagement by the existing targeted government. And, and you see this all around the world, you know, in the 19th century, and even in the 20th century, a colonialist just did what they did. They didn't have to pretend it was for some noble cause. Like, you know, the US uh, Marines and army were sent to Haiti in, 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 2000, in, in 1915, and they just marched right into Port-au-Prince to the main bank and they, they took all the gold of the country's gold, took it out of the country, put it on a boat, and sent it to First City a National Bank in New York, now Citibank. They just did it, and they did it because they could do it. 
Uh, now we have the UK where, again, where Julian Assange is holed up. They seize $1.2 billion of Venezuelan gold. Uh, but unlike w Wilson and the Americans 103 years ago, they don't have to, they, they can't just take it. They have to say it's for something good. It's for a noble cause. It's for freedom. It's for democracy. We're seizing the gold. But the only difference between imperialism in 1915 and 2019 is the explanations change, but the motivation is pretty much the same. And it's the loot. Why do you think the explanations change? Huh? Why? Why do you why? think the explanations change? I have an it's, idea. I want to know what you think. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's because the because of the empowerment of human beings in the political process are such the franchise exists globally. People go to the polls. You can't completely discount the masses of uh, people and their opinions as could be done during the colonial era. So now they have to be sort of massaged or manipulated or Chomsky puts it, the manufactured consent because the unlike 100 or 200 years ago where the, the opinions of the masses of people anywhere didn't matter, they do now. So the, the form of ruling class rule over society has shifted. It's been, uh, it's required some sophistication in language. You can't just say, this is going to be uh, 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 the American century, although that's coming back now too, some of the colonial language. So I think it's like, I think that's the main reason because of the empowerment of people and the colonial slaves of 200 years ago will not accept the idea that they should be colonial slaves ever again. So the, the appeal to them has to be based on, on something else. Yes, I mean, we can uh, absolutely public opinion became an issue in the First World War when many, many Americans did not want the U.S. to enter that war. So uh, Wilson created the Creel Committee, which was basically a propaganda ministry to sell the war to the American people, out of which the private business uh, public relations industry was born. It was uh, quite successful. So they had to start dealing with the issue of the public's opinion to manipulate and suppress it. But again, during the Vietnam War, maybe for the first time and only time really in U.S. history, there was such a huge uh, public protest that um, uh, they, have to, they have to take that into account in the future. So they have to cloak it in this rhetoric. And they also had to change, uh, you know, when, when, they, when Bush invaded uh, the first Gulf War, he said that the Vietnam syndrome was over because they decided that uh, they had to stop that kind of public protest and the media no longer, uh, the government no longer allowed reporters on the ground as they were in Vietnam to bring the war home in its bloody gore to the American public. So we had the advent of the embedded reporter. So you're right, all these controls that have to be implemented because they are now a little bit more fearful of the public reaction. And in the developing countries, after the success of various revolutions throughout developing countries in Africa, the whole uh, anti-colonial and uh, decolonization of Africa, Cuba, etc. They, as you just aptly pointed out, those countries do not accept American interference the way they would have accepted what Belgium did in the Congo, for example, in the late 19th century. So we're in an era, era and we have to bring in WikiLeaks here, because, and this is why they want him so badly. They want Julian Assange, because he has revealed, in a way that the media has never done before. Uh, the, the absolute uh, truth, because those are the documents themselves. This is not journalists being leaked or being told something. We can read the documents for ourselves, so we know how the government operates. We know they use sanctions as economic warfare, as that document they just republished, uh, Weekly just republished, showed. So this is another reason why they've got to fight back and use sophisticated PR and also try to arrest Julian Assange and shut down WikiLeaks, but they can't do it. Because as we, we've just seen, the new, a new tranche of documents came out in the Vatican this week, so WikiLeaks works continue. Brian, if you could stay with us a few more minutes, otherwise I understand if you have to go. Yeah, let me just, I, I do have to run, but let me just say, I want to comment on, on some of your points there. Uh, because I think it's, you've, we're, we've gone into an important subject right now. Um, and again, why this actually matters so much. Uh, when, when Bush Sr., George H.W. Bush, ran to the microphone when the, the war in the first Gulf War ended, February 28th, 1991. His first words were the ghosts of Vietnam are, beyond, are behind us. 
uh, meaning, and he says in his memoirs that the, and, and then he went on to say, and he repeats this in his memoirs, that the Vietnam syndrome is over. Now the Vietnam syndrome was that strange, you know, that strange illness uh, that the American people had whereby they didn't want to support sending uh, their sons and some of their daughters, but mainly their sons to far off lands to fight in wars that they didn't understand, wars uh, that were de depriving people in the quote third world of you know, their basic rights to determine their own destiny. So the Vietnam syndrome was a thing. I mean, it really was a thing. It became a restraint on the ability of the American government to escalate the war. That's why when Nixon and Kissinger said they had that secret weapon to end the war in 69 when they came in, which was really to drop a nuclear bomb on Vietnam. Uh, one, the Vietnamese didn't blink, but also the moratoriums, there's massive mobilizations in the fall of 1989, 19 uh, 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 1969 made it clear that if they used atomic weapons or if they escalated the war in any uh, appreciable way like that, that there would be a civil war inside the United States. And so that became a restraint on them. So George H.W. Bush was so worried that the Vietnam syndrome would carry over in the early 1990s and be a restraint on the U.S. invasion of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, but ultimately Iraq. And, you know, that shows that the, uh, the governments actually do care in this day and age about public opinion. And, you know, I think it was fanciful on their part. They're, they had their fingers crossed. They didn't know if there would be a massive anti-war movement. There was, in fact, a massive anti-war movement at that time. But the war ended so quickly that the anti-war movement petered out. And then the same thing happened in the run-up to the 2003 war. Uh, we were having demonstrations literally of hundreds of thousands of people month after month after month. But then once the war was over in three weeks, because the Iraqi government had it was a small it's a small country and it could be overwhelmed and it was already hobbled by economic sanctions. So the Saddam's army was vanquished in three weeks. And then so 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 here we are again, public opinion, the 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 rulers, the the powers that be. Uh, usually day to day, they, they have their way because they manipulate and mold public opinion. But, you know, WikiLeaks countered that. WikiLeaks, without WikiLeaks, we don't mm -hmm. have core information that's necessary to shift the dominant political narrative. Nobody else was doing that or very few people did it. And not with this level of consistency. WikiLeaks was for real, is for real. And their work is continuing. So, I, I mean, just think about the past 15 years without WikiLeaks. It would, be, it would be a different historical era. And that's what they want to do. They want to vanquish WikiLeaks because they don't want this kind of truth telling uh, to continue to keep going. Because it could prevent one of some of their war schemes. Had we had Le WikiLeaks in 2002, and we'd learn things by uh, leakers and whistleblowers through WikiLeaks about the lead up to the Iraq invasion, Maybe it wouldn't have happened. It may have yeah. turned the public against. Well, as you said, there were those were the largest demonstrations in history they were across the entire globe. Uh, I was at one in New York, and they were a million in London, I think, and uh, Sydney, yeah. everywhere. Extraordinary, yeah. and it did not stop them. And the Security Council never gave them the resolution they needed either. That's why they were racing to war because the public opinion was building so strongly. They had to rush to war not because Iraq was a preeminent threat, but because the anti-war movement could overwhelm them. So they had to go in, they had to do it quick, they had to get it over with. Joe, I have to, I have to take off. Um, I do wanna thank you again for, for hosting uh, week after week uh, on, the part, on my part and the part of the Answer Coalition as we're doing this work against the coup, uh, the coup effort against Venezuela. We are going to continue as we do this to raise uh, the case of WikiLeaks and Julian in particular, and uh, we'll be glad to come back on, on future online vigils. Well, thank you, Brian, for being here now, I think three weeks in a row, and I really appreciate you stopping by, and it was a short but very interesting conversation with you. Thank you again.